And we want to congratulate parents as well. It's an accomplishment for them too, isn't it? Uh, Twelve years of schooling. Someone said that uh, parents are people who carry money. They carry photos where their money used to be. And uh, so that can be true. It's a big investment uh, to raise a family. uh, But um, it's a joy and a satisfaction. And we want all of you parents of our graduates to feel proud. And we appreciate you as well. And, And I have to say to any teachers in the room today, or homeschool parents, uh, coaches. This is, uh, this is one of the satisfactions that you can enjoy as you've invested in the lives of others, and sometimes you don't always see all of the results, but thankfully, we live in a civil society where there are many, many people, most people out there contributing, working hard, uh, trying to be honest, trying to love and raise their families, And every teacher, every coach, every faithful teacher, faithful coach, homeschool parent, uh, you have a huge part in that. And and I want you to feel that sense of congratulations and satisfaction as well. Uh, This morning, I'm going to uh, continue in our series of God's Blueprint for the Home. And as I think of graduates and part of their future for most of them will likely be the, the establishing of a home. And I want to share a message today on wisdom as I think of graduation and the cap and gown and the symbolism of having wisdom for life. I want to speak on the wisdom to choose a godly or a good spouse or a life partner. And this can be, if you're already married, then it would be the wisdom to be a good or godly spouse. And if you're not married at all, you're not thinking of getting married, you don't want to get married, it's the last thing on your mind, that's okay too. It's the wisdom to be a good and godly person. And to consider these matters, and I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to read beginning in verse 24, and if you're using the Black Pew Bible that's there in front of you, all you have to do is turn to page 1,118, and that's going to bring you to Matthew chapter 7, and this is a, you know, it might be a heavy message for our young people as they think about, as Pastor Adam was mentioning, some of the big decisions out there. But it's not like no one's pressuring you to find a spouse this week, right? But it's good to be accumulating this wisdom, this kind of grid, this mental idea of how do you go about this? What in a godly way, in a biblical way, how do you approach this? You want to be begin building these ideas in your mind. Uh, So wisdom, right? The Bible says if any of you lack wisdom... Wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all people uh, liberally and uh, does not withhold it. And so, wisdom is a great matter for prayer and asking God for help in these big decisions of life. The Bible also says that those who walk with wise people will be wise. And so, the, the idea of accumulating wisdom and learning from others, learning from others who've already kind of been there and done that, learning from your parents. So there is this collective wisdom that people have been pouring into our lives through the years. And now, as we launch out on our own, in little by little, now we have to begin to apply that wisdom. And um, so all of those things that your parents have been telling you over the years, now how are you going to live those out? You go away to college and you begin making decisions on your own. And you're faced with temptations or pressures or the wrong crowd or different situations where your values and your biblical wisdom or godly wisdom, it's all going to be tested. And so and, and, and we can all make mistakes, but we want to go back to God's Word, God's love for us, His presence in our life, and those values and wisdom instructions that our parents have tried to pass on to us and that are shown to us in God's Word. So that's the encouragement and challenge for each one of us and for all of the single people in the room that do think of being married one day. How do you apply that? To choosing a good and a godly spouse. 
Now we're going to read here in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24, and I want to invite you to stand with me this morning for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read down through the end of this chapter. It's just five verses. I'll read aloud, and I invite you to follow along with me in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. Here God's Word says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. See, the, the, the wisdom of that house and its construction is going to be tested. And it says it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So that's the ideal. That's what we're shooting for. And, um, but it doesn't... So that's the value of of what we're talking about today. But verse 26 paints an entirely different picture. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And that's a, a sad thing. That's a loss. That's a tragedy. That's a heartache. And, um, and it, you know, it, it can really mark our life. It can be a great fall so that it's something that really impacts us in a, in a great way. And this is what we want to try to avoid in life as much as we can and recover from and go on and start building upon the rock. Verse 28 kind of uh, gives us a clue of, of these verses and, and how far they apply. Notice what it says, and so it was. When Jesus ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching. And it ends there. And well, I guess it goes on in verse 29. It's on the other page. I almost lost it there. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. And you may be seated. And may God bless the reading of his word. So you can tell that verses 28 and 29 are kind of a conclusion but they're not just the conclusion to the, the brief story that we read about the house on the rock. They are a conclusion to this entire section of this passage of Scripture. This is one of the uh, core teachings of Jesus that he gave in all of his ministry. It starts in Matthew chapter 5, and it ends here at the end of chapter 7. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. And it is one of the core teachings of Jesus Christ. This is Christ giving his wisdom. This is Christ instructing his followers how to direct and guide their own lives. And he does this for three chapters. I mean, this is some of the core. The Beatitudes are found here. The Lord's Prayer is found here. The golden rule is found here and many other teachings of Christ. And as he, this is like the collective wisdom of the God who loves you. And then he says, as he ends, he's coming to the conclusion, you know, and like preachers come to conclusions. And do you know what it means when a pastor takes off his watch and sets it right there on the pulpit? Do you know what that means? Absolutely nothing, right? <laughs> Jesus is winding down his sermon. He's landing the plane when he talks about building your house on the rock. But but, uh, when he says those who hear these teachings and do them, he's talking about the last three chapters that he just taught. And of course, we would have to expand that to all of his teachings, and we would have to expand that to all of the Bible. But he's talking about the last three chapters. This is like the conclusion of his sermon. He ended with an illustration, right? And, and, and so I would encourage every young person in this room to consider the Sermon on the Mount as your guide in life and as your guide in choosing a mate. Now, our, our theme has been God's blueprint for the home, or we broadened it and said God's blueprint for life. So here we see a house that's built, and it's built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things whenever you buy a home, and uh, most folks who bought a home know this, but it's, it's good to talk about, you want to get a home inspection. You have to, you know, you sign a contract, you know, I want to buy this house. 
but there's some, you know, the fine print in there, and it's like, I have the right to get this house inspected by a professional, and if there's anything majorly wrong with this house, I have the right to back out of my agreement to buy this house. Okay, that's the fine print in the contract. So you say, oh, I love this house. It's so pretty. It's so nice. He's so handsome. She's so sweet. I want this one. And you sign, you know, you might be get engaged. You, that's like signing a contract for a purchase agreement on a house. But wait a minute, there's a clause in there, and you definitely want to exercise this clause. I want the home inspected. Because it looks nice on the outside. But the home inspector, he's a professional. He's a little nerdy when it comes to houses. He's going to go through that. Oh, you walked through with a, a salesperson, you know, and, and it's all painted pretty and the carpet's been clean. And, yeah, but this home inspector, they're going to go through that property with a fine tooth comb. They're going to look at every electrical connection. They're going to look at the, they're going to climb up on the roof. They're going to go in the attic. They're going to go down in the basement. They're going to look at the foundation for any cracks or any pipes with any leaks or anything majorly wrong. They're going to find everything about that house. That's a home inspection. Matthew chapter 7 is a home inspection for that person you think might be a good spouse. It's an inspect, it's a checklist for you to go through and say, is this person really how they appear to be? And you want to dig a little deeper. You want to be a little more careful. And that's what we have here is Christ's wisdom in, in choosing a spouse according to the blueprint of God. And so we're going to look at it together. Real, and I'm going to go through this briefly. My only consolation in kind of summarizing some of these points is that you have a Bible that has Matthew chapter 7 in it, and you can go back and refer to this again and again. It begins in verses 1 through 5. Notice what it says. Uh, For with what, with what judge, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The first wisdom of Christ in choosing a godly spouse or being a godly spouse or a godly person is is that you have to judge others fairly and you want to make sure that other person is someone who is fair and honest in their judging. Now, it says in verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. And if we just take that verse alone, a lot of people have said, oh, you never should judge. Um, No, that's not what it's saying. It goes on to explain that you shouldn't judge overly harsh unless you're ready to be judged by others overly harsh. So it's not about not judging. It's about judging properly and fairly and honestly in a gracious manner. Now, we obviously know that it's not wrong to judge. We make judgments every single day. As a matter of fact, Choosing a spouse is the biggest judgment you will ever make in your life. You are judging that person. You are, and you'd find the the right one or Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. You are making a judgment. This is the judgment you are making. Out of all of the other, if you're a guy, out of all the other girls on the face of the planet, or at least the ones I know, the ones I can find, the ones that will give me the time of day, out of all of them, this is the one. I judge all of the others as no, and I judge this one as yes. That's a judgment. That's like the biggest judgment you'll ever make in your life. But you want to do it honestly and fairly. And and, and this verse goes on to say you you don't want to be a hypocrite about it, where you're overly critical, overly judgmental, overly harsh, but you don't want them... This is like you're trying to find a godly person, someone that is 
critical and harsh and mean-spirited or nothing's ever good enough or they, they just find everything wrong and they're constantly pointing out errors and mistakes and it's just all about that, you don't want to live with that kind of person. You don't want to be a, around that kind of person. And um, so you have to have, do they have humility that they're not overly harsh and overly critical and they're picking out specks because the problem with someone who's overly harsh or overly critical is they're not, it's not reciprocal. They have this huge plank, this huge mistake, this huge error, which we all do, but they're not, they're not considering that in the way, they're not doing it in, grac- in a gracious manner, realizing that they have their own mistakes too. So they're not seeing their own mistakes. They're just judging your mistakes. And that is a bad sign. So you want to be, so, be someone who judges fairly, that has humility and can recognize their own planks, their own errors, and admit to them instead of just being overly critical of you. And um, there's a lot of grace that comes from recognizing that, hey, you know what? I'm not perfect either. I've got my own flaws. And that helps us to be more gracious in our treatment. But if someone doesn't have that, then that's not going to go well. You're not going to be happy living with that person. Now, there are some things that you do have to judge. And, I, you know, I, I spoke... The other day, and I was going to mention this, and I didn't. I can't remember the context of the message right now. But there are three things that will destroy any marriage. They're, they're, and, and if you're not married, they are non-starters. They're like, this is, most marriages will not survive this. And, and you don't want to go into a marriage with any of these things. And I'll just give them to you, and I've got to go on. The first one is adultery, unfaithfulness. If this person... Uh, re- in a marriage, someone who re, re, you can maybe survive adultery one time, maybe twice, maybe. I'm not sure. I don't know a lot of cases. I, I know cases where marriages can survive and overcome adultery. But multiple cases of adultery, that marriage will not survive. Uh, another one would be addictions. An, an addiction to an, uh, an addiction is basically that person saying, I love my addiction. I love alcohol. I love drugs. I love pornography. I love this more than I love you. They are, essentially, they're breaking the marital bonds because they're saying, I choose this over you. Oh, but if you still want to stay with me, that's even better. But this is really my first love. And most marriages will not survive addictions if... if the person that you're interested in has addictions in their past. You need to let a lot of time go by. I'm talking a year or two where they're like demonstrating clearly that they have complete victory over that. And it's always going to be a weakness in their life. And you just don't want to get embroiled in that. It's just, and the third one would be abuse. A marriage cannot survive abuse. And they may stay together, but that's not a marriage. And you, anybody that's abusive, you want to run as fast as you can the other direction. Just ask, you know, people in the news in these recent days, right? Without mentioning any names. So let's move on here because there's a, another bit of wisdom that we find here from Christ himself. And he says, these are my words. And if you will build with these words, you're going to build a house that can withstand time and storms. And the third bit of wisdom we see in verse uh, 6. Verse 6, where it says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. So what what wisdom are we going to pull from this? The third bit of wisdom is you have to have someone. You want to look for someone. You want to uh, uh, look for a godly, good person who respects you and your values and respects and shares your values and your boundaries and your goals. Because if you don't, if if you get someone who is a pig 
or it was a dog, all that means is that they're going to take. You know, and when he says dog here, this is not, you know, cute little labradoodle in your living room couch. This is like first century street dog that will, they will bite each other and they will bite anyone that comes around them. Okay, that's the kind of dog that they're talking about here, okay? We need to make, so, it, so it's, it's like a pigs are one of the most violent, dangerous animals you can be around. Now, not the little piglets that you see on, you know, YouTube or TikTok, but like wild, you know, half wild pigs, right? And you can, you can feed them, dogs are the same way, you can feed them and they will keep eating, they will keep taking, they will keep taking, and they will keep taking, and you're feeding them. If you get your hand too close, they will bite your hand because they're takers. And all they know how to do is take and take and take, and they don't know how to give. And, and you need to stay away from that kind of a person. Don't marry a pig because you are holy and you are precious, and you are a valuable pearl, and you are a child of God, and you deserve to marry someone who is going to give respect and appreciate you and value you and value what is important to you, and vice versa. So if, if two pigs marry each other, and I'm, that's a strong word, but hey, it's Sunday. I'm going to keep you guys awake, Okay. If two takers marry each other, phew, that marriage is not going to last very long. There might be, you know, might be a funeral and someone in jail. I don't know. That's terrible. Two takers are just going to tear each other apart. But what happens if a one taker marries a giver? This person who is selfish and self-centered, and they marry a noble person who just didn't see it clearly enough. And they end, that, that marriage, that is what it says here. Over time, that can, it can take years, but that person is going to trample you. That person is going to tear, tear you apart piece by piece. And that's not healthy. That's not good. You deserve better than that. But wait a minute. When two givers marry each other, that's a beautiful thing. That, that can bring happiness and, and that can bring uh, goodness to your life. And, and so, you know, on the one hand, we're all in discipleship mode. We're all striving to learn to be better givers and to realize that we don't have to be takers in order to find peace and satisfaction in life. So we're growing in these areas. But I'm just saying, be careful. What does the word say? The word says, beware. It says, beware of... Um, Dogs, the Bible says. The Bible says that. So that's all I'm saying is just beware. Now then, uh, there's another bit of wisdom here I want you to see. It's in verses 7 and 8 where it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So this is the fourth bit of wisdom that we see here, and that is, is that you want to pray constantly for God's help and direction. Uh, it says here, ask, seek, and knock. And these, all three of these verbs are in a, a, a tense of verb, a, a linear tense, where it means that you're asking and you're asking and you're asking and you keep asking. And you're seeking and you're seeking and you're seeking. You're seeking God's help in finding the right person. And you're knocking and you're knocking, you're knocking on the door of God, of God, God's throne to get the help that you need, but you're doing it constantly. And so every young person, one of your continual prayers should be to ha- for God to help you find the right person. You should make it a serious matter of prayer. It is a big decision. It's the most... Uh, The most important decision you'll ever make in your life is what will you do with Jesus? To accept Christ as your Savior or reject Christ, that is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. The second biggest decision that most people will ever make in their life, the second biggest decision you could ever make is who will I choose to bond myself to in life as a life partner? Who will I seek to intricately interweave my heart with 
That is a huge decision. And is there, can I get it wrong? Oh yeah, there's lots of places to get it wrong. I'm mentioning just like five or six today. This is why you want to pray. This is why you need God's help. This is why uh, you want to make it your constant prayer. Serious prayer. And you trust God. Does it have to be scary? I think it's a little bit scary. But you, you don't want to live in mortal fear. You, that's why we have faith and that's why we pray and that's why we trust God. And so you want to ask and ask and ask and seek God's help and seek God's help. And I was, I was 32 before I finally convinced a, a, a pretty young lady to say yes to me, you know, because I'm kind of a hard case, you know, whatever. 32 years. So I probably started praying, you know, like when I was early in college. You know, you start to think about some of these things. Some of you are smarter than me. You've already started praying and you're still in high school. Great for you. That's good. I had a long time to pray. And uh, believe it or not, you won't believe this, but there were one or two other candidates that did cross my path in the period of all of those years. Now, that's hard for you to believe. They might have said yes. I don't know. But all I can say is thank God that God answered with the person he answered. And, you know, that involved the time that he answered and all of those things. You want to ask and seek. And, yes, you have to be patient. You know, you, it's like the one girl was praying and she said, Dear Lord, the train's left the station. Dear Lord, I missed out. Dear Lord, I'll never get married now. Dear Lord, I'm 22 and I still haven't been married yet. No, it can take long. You have to be patient, but pray and wait for the right person. And, um, and it goes on, you know, uh, look at verses 9 through 11 here real quick. It says, or this is still referring to God's goodness in answering our prayer and giving us good things. If we trust God and we tr sincerely try to use all of the wisdom we can and we, we really pray about it, if there's no guarantees, okay? There's just no guarantees marrying, marrying another human being. You know, it's, it's always a matter of risk, but you just want to lower that as much as possible. And so God says, I'm good, a good God that I love to give good gifts to my children, he says in verse 11. But notice what he says. He describes something different. He says, which one of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a poisonous snake. Or if, if you then, being evil, know how to get good, good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So that's the promise. That's the reassurance. That's the faith we have when we pray. But he describes in there this kind of evil scenario that apparently... It's very rare and it's hard to imagine that there could be people so evil out there that they would find people that, that trust them and do evil to them. Those people exist. And unfortunately, sometimes they become parents. And unfortunately, sometimes they marry nice, sincere, good people. But they're evil. They're like pure evil. And, and if you ever want to, uh, how many of you ladies know the term gaslighting? Raise your hand. Have you ever heard the term gaslighting? Oh, come on now. How many of you, male, female, everyone, if you know the term gaslighting, raise your hand. Do you know what it means? <laughs> no, that's not it. Gaslighting is what narcissistic, sociopathic, evil people do to the people they care about. They blow smoke. And, and they... I'm not, I can't get into it. Gaslighting is in the Bible, and it's right here in these verses. Here is this person that pretends to give you something good, but in reality, they're giving you something completely evil. And they're, they're spinning it. So, oh, this is good. Yeah, this is good. This is gaslighting. There are evil people. So it goes back to our third bit of wisdom, beware of pigs. And so you want to be, this is gaslighting. And they, they, they toy with you, they, they cruel jokes, oh, I'm just kidding. They do something really mean, they, oh, I was just joking. And they kind of just toy with your whole sense of reality in a spirit of meanness and evil. 
And it kind of goes on. Uh, so you want to beware of sinister, manipulative, cruel people. You want to be aware of that. Be careful of that. We see that right here in our text. Instead of a person, instead of a person, so if you have any red flags, go with those red flags. Talk about those red flags. Try to get to the bottom of those red flags. And you've got to do all of this before you commit. So instead of that kind of a person, what you want to be looking for is a person in verse 12. That's the one you're looking for. Because there it says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophet. This is the golden rule. So you ask for a fish. You ask for a favor. And they give you a poisonous snake. Oh, I was just kidding. It was just a joke. You ask for a piece of bread, and they clobber you upside the head with a stone. Oh, it was just a joke. You know, bread and stone, they look kind of alike. It's just, I'm just kidding, right? That's not a good person. That, that's not a person you can live with. That's a, they don't respect you. They don't care. They don't value you. But verse 12 is a person that they treat you how they would want to be treated. They, we all want to be treated well, so they're treating you well. They're living by the golden rule. They have respect for people. They have a sense of fairness and equity, and, you, and it's demonstrated. So the wisdom of Christ, is, of Christ is that you keep your eye out for someone who has built their character and their life on the golden rule, on these values of respect. And, and, and this is where you say, well, this can get kind of tricky, Pastor Phil. You're right. So you can't really judge how they treat you as much. I mean, that's, that's obviously an indicator. There's room for red flags there. However, they can treat you really well and be faking it. So what you want to look at is how do they treat other lesser people in their life? How do they treat their parents? How do they treat their younger siblings? How do they treat the, the server in the restaurant? How do they treat uh, the person who cut them off on the road? How do they treat people? How do they treat the person behind the customer service desk? That's what you want to look. That's where they're going to really live out the golden rule or not. So just don't go by, oh, they treat me so nice. Well, of course they do. They're, they're interested in you. But how do they treat the person that, they ha that can't really do anything for them? That's what you want to look out for. Now, here, let's uh, move on quickly here. And, 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 you, and, you, and you don't underestimate what I'm saying. Don't minimize the importance of someone that treats others with respect and kindness and uh, fairness. Because this person that that you're considering on some level embedding your life with, you deserve to marry that kind of a person. You deserve to marry a good person. You deserve to marry a godly person. Your own future happiness and well-being in large measure depends upon it. Not just that, but your children, your future children deserve for you to marry a good and godly person who lives by the golden rule. Your children deserve that. Bless your own future children by, by having a certain amount of criteria and wisdom in choosing who you're going to partner your life with. They will likely be the parent of your children. Do you feel good at the thought that this other person is going to be helping me to raise my own children? Does that inspire confidence and reassurance to you? Or does it give you pause? If it gives you pause, then that's a red flag. You say, well, Pastor Phil, uh, according to what you're saying, I'm going over here, okay? Is that okay? I didn't bring my watch and I didn't set it on the pulpit. And it doesn't mean anything. 
say, well, Pastor Phil, what you're describing is I'll never find someone to marry. Well, I wouldn't say never. It might be harder, but that's okay. Because that's exactly what our next bit of wisdom tells us in verses 13 and 14. Notice what it says here. It says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life and goodness and blessing and happiness and well-being, and few there be who find it. So now, out of all of society, there are few, the Bible says, out of all of the world, there are few who truly are followers of Christ. There are few that truly love and faithfully follow the Lord. That's what this verse teaches. And it stands to reason, if that's true, then it stands to reason that there are few, out of all of society, there are few who would qualify as a suitable, compatible spouse for you. There are few. Yes. The day you declare that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you just narrowed the the pool of prospective candidates by a huge margin. That's true. But that's okay. I'm a, I, I, I'm a follower of Christ. I go to church. I'm a child of God. I, I am purposing in my heart to live with sexual integrity. I, I, marriage means something to me. It is valuable. It is a value that I hold. And, and I want to be a good person and a godly person and contribute with someone else that is a good and godly person to building a good and godly marriage that's going to bring blessing and peace and prosperity, hopefully, aside from all of the trials and difficulties. That's narrow. That's just narrow. Someone said, oh, but there's lots of fish in the sea. Have you ever heard that expression? Oh, there's lots of fish in the sea. That's true. But I happen to know a little bit of something about the fish in the sea. I just do because I'm from the Gulf Coast and I fish a lot. Do you know what? There's lots of fish in the sea. But do you know what? A lot of them are throwback fish. That's not what we call them. I'm not going to tell you what we call them because that would be... I've already used pig, right? I can use this word. We call them trash fish. They're they're rough. They call them rough fish. Throwback fish. You catch a lizard fish and you throw it back (laughs) because it's not worth eating. You catch um, a puffer fish and you throw it back. You know, you pull in... uh, a hardhead catfish, that's a, that's a real name of a fish. You pull one of those in your line, you don't even want to touch it. It gets this ooey slime all over your line. You just like try to get the pliers in there and like shake it off without even bringing it in the boat or having to touch it. That's what you need to do when you hook a hardhead catfish. Don't even bring them in the boat. I'm speaking metaphorically here. Are you guys following me here? <laughs> But if you're patient and if you use the right bait, you'll get a nibble and you'll reel in a big, delicious red snapper. So good. (laughs) Or you'll reel in, literally, this is a name, a queen triggerfish, and they are so good. There's a lot of fish in the sea, but there's not a lot of fish in the sea. They're not all worth keeping. And that's important to make that distinction. Now then lastly and quickly, I've got to end here. The last bit of wisdom is the most obvious one. And it, and it goes from verse 15 all the way down to verse, you know, verse probably verse 23. And it's basically, I'm going to summarize, you have to make sure you marry a true believer. Someone that is truly a follower of Christ. And they have demonstrated that by the fruits of the Spirit and not the works of the flesh. That they're striving to follow Christ. They're trying to be a good Christian. They're trying to uh, follow the Holy Spirit working in their heart. That it's sincere. And that's only demonstrated over time. 
So, so, you know, a lot of times, if someone's interested in us, they will be interested in the things you're interested in, not because they are truly interested in those things, but because they're interested in you, right? It's the proverbial, oh, I'm a Christian, will you go to church with me, right? Oh, if you're going to date me, you have to go to church because I'm a Christian. So they come to church, and I, I mean, I've seen it over the years. I, I, I know, I've seen, you know, I'm remembering a story right now of a, a young lady. She went to university. She met a nice guy, and he was, he was a nice-looking guy. He was, he was better looking than she was, actually. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and he started coming to church. He got he had he had a, he was sing, he, was a, he could sing so he immediately he had connected with music ministry he made a profession of faith got baptized all of this stuff he was there all the time and then they got married i mean he they dated for like over a year like 2 years he was in church serving active like one of the crowd all of that and they got married and the like the last thing i knew like he had bugged out and left her and because sometimes they'll be interested in the things you're interested in, not because they're really interested in those things, but because they're interested in you. So they're not even a genuine Christian. And you need to make sure, the Bible says that um, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, right? So you don't want to do that. That's just like the basic 101 of Christian dating, right? Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So these are principles that, do we all, do we all make mistakes? Yes, we all make mistakes. Can we recover from those mistakes? Yes, we can recover from those mistakes. Is this wisdom that I've shared with you this morning? Uh, yes, in as much as it is God's word, it is wisdom that you can begin to build in your life to be a more godly person, to be a more godly spouse, and for those of you who are single, to help you develop some kind of criteria in finding a godly spouse or potential life partner. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, I pray that we would all take seriously the teachings of Christ. They are a rock in a wishy-washy world. They what bring stability and strength to our lives when we build upon them. So, Father God, I pray that we would each see the, the value and the benefit and the wisdom of following Christ with all of our hearts and seeking important relationships with people who likewise are committed to the wisdom of Christ. Help us, I pray. I pray for our graduates, for our young people, for each one of us, that we would truly build our lives upon the words and wisdom of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and be dismissed. I did want to mention just briefly um, a couple of announcements, and then we'll be dismissed. This evening, we have one, our one evening service for the month. It's called... The Legacy of a Father. It's, it's going to be a beautiful service. We're going to have a time of fellowship at the end. We actually have a pie baking contest tonight, and there'll be pie for everyone. Uh, that's at 6 p.m. out in the Student Center. And then, in a couple of weeks, on June the 19th, is Father's Day. And we're going to, on that day, we're going to have one outdoor service like we had last summer. We're going to have an outdoor service on Father's Day out back behind the Student Center. And uh, our own J.D. Schmucker is going to bring a message on that day. So it's just one service. It's at 10 a.m. So in two weeks, you want to come a little bit later at 10 a.m. for that very special service. And um, I think that's all I wanted to mention right now. Be sure to fellowship with those around you. Greet our guests. God bless you. You are dismissed.